Hi, I'm Maria, and for my project, I chose to focus on the cardiovascular system and how that interacts with both the virus and COVID-19, the disease. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. First, I'm going to review the cardiovascular system and also cardiovascular disease, defining those and explaining what they are. Also, I'm going to talk about high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, and just blood pressure in general. Then I'm going to describe the physical link between SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and our cardiovascular system, specifically looking at the binding protein known as ACE2, which helps increase blood pressure. Then I'm going to discuss generally COVID-19, the disease, and how that interacts with our cardiovascular system and what implications high blood pressure has in patients. And then also talk a little bit about blood viscosity and trends that have been noticed lately in COVID patients. So a little background on the cardiovascular system. Um, the easiest way to think about it, it has three main compo components. Uh, it's the heart, the blood vessels and arteries, and also the blood flowing through it. And the purpose of this system is to deliver nutrients and remove waste. Um, that otherwise would build up and damage our organs. So as many of us know, this is powered by our heart and well, mechanically powered by our heart, by muscle contractions and relaxations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that process on the next slide, specifically looking at blood pressure. And then I also wanted to define cardiovascular disease. And really, cardiovascular disease is a broad term that talks about many conditions and it all boils down to the main concept of there's inadequate perfusion. Your blood isn't really getting where it needs to go or something's blocking it. Um, some examples are just, in general, congestive heart failure, um, COPD, and heart disease. So moving on to blood pressure. What I'm going to focus on a lot in this presentation is hypertension or high blood pressure because it really does cause a lot of damage in our bodies. Um, so a normal blood pressure, you have a systolic of 120 over a diastolic of 80. And depending on where you look, there are different definitions of when you reach the hypertensive point. So the CDC defi defines high blood pressure as 140 over 90. Anything greater than that, they consider hypertensive. But if you look towards the American Heart Association, they lower that standard a little bit and they say anything over 130 over 80. So anything greater than that is considered hypertensive. Um, and this means that there's a lot more force being exerted on your vessels than needs to be. So our bodies aren't meant to have high blood pressure over long periods of time. It uses that to compensate for when we're exercising or we just need a little more perfusion. So having this high pressure inside of us, it damages the vessel walls. It causes them to be less elastic so less likely to relax in those times when we don't need um, more blood delivered. And this has both, this has some very uncomfortable effects for the person, anything from can cause organ damage because pressure, they begin to thicken over time, and that also reduces the rate of diffusion of oxygen and removal of waste from our organs. So not only does that create a hypoxic environment, meaning the tissues are lacking the oxygen they need, it also creates a buildup of those harmful substances that would otherwise be removed, and that's what can lead to the organ damage. So blood pressure is regulated by two main mechanisms. The first one is in our brain. It's the cardiovascular center found in the medulla oblongata. And this really responds to specific types of receptors. You have your baroreceptors, which have to do with the, um, 
the amount of pressure being pushed on your blood vessels. So as the pressure inside of it increases, the baroreceptors are stretched a little bit and they understand that. So they send a signal letting the body know that um, they need to vasodilate to reduce the pressure on the walls of our arteries and vice versa. If they sense that the blood pressure is dropping, they'll say, hey, we need to constrict. So those signals are sent up there and also um, chemical signals like CO2 concentrations and oxygen concentrations in the blood level are sent there for regulation. But specifically the one I'm gonna be focusing on is the hormonal regulation. And that I'm going to look into the uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system and I'll get into that on the next slide. So this one I found easier to describe with a picture because it's a lot of moving parts and it makes it easier to see. So angiotensin at the top, it's in the little orange box. When your blood pressure falls, what happens is angiotensin is released by the liver and then renin is released by the kidneys and renin converts angiotensin into angiotensin 1. So from that point, angiotensin 1 binds to ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, and turns angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. From there, angiotensin 2 can bind to ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it's a lot of similar names, so on the next slide, I go through the parts and their functions. Um, ACE2 is the receptor we're gonna be looking at because this is the receptor used to raise blood pressure. And what happens is when angiotensin II binds to ACE2, it triggers a response inside the cell that causes vasoconstriction, which the blood vessels tighten to raise, in the, pre to raise the pressure inside. And also it can lead to a pro-inflammatory response. So in patients who are suffering from hypertension, they're prescribed um, angiotensin receptor blockers. You can see that on the bottom of this slide and also ACE1 inhibitors. And what they do is it prevents the body from further constricting their blood vessels. And this is helpful and prescribed in many situations. And when COVID first, hit and scientists figured out that, or revisited the idea that SARS was binding to ACE2. They looked at this mechanism of lowering or preventing, so these medications prescribed to assist with hypertension were believed to upregulate or increase the production of ACE2, which would provide SARS-CoV-2 virus more opportunities to bind and infiltrate the cells. However, after studies, there was insufficient evidence to support this claim. Um, and it was looked into on many accounts, but there was no increased binding of SARS-CoV-2. So this is just the same image I used from before, and I'm gonna explain the, you can see the virus binding to the same ACE2 receptors. Over here, the same ACE2 receptors that angiotensin II would bind to. Um, and that is the physical relationship between ACE2, SARS-CoV-2, and treatment for hypertension. So outside of the physical link between the SARS virus binding to ACE2, there have also been relationships drawn based off of cytokines and cytokine storms. So what a, cytos what a cytokine storm is, um, it's generally an overreaction of the immune system. So when a virus infiltrates the body's first line of defense, is trying to kill it off. Um, however, sometimes an overpopulation of these proteins, signaling proteins called cytokines, 
can be present and eventually overpower the regulatory methods and start attacking healthy tissues. And this can cause tissue damage, organ damage, and be overall harmful to the body. So previous studies independent of COVID have drawn a relationship between hypertension and cytokines. Generally, there's been a pattern noticed that in hypertensive patients, there have been more cytokines present in the blood flow, specifically IL-6. Um, and that is kind of, it sets COVID patients up, hypertensive COVID patients up for that overreaction or overimmune response. Um, and when these cytokine storms do take place, one of the complications can be an increase in fibrogen, which leads to a greater blood viscosity. And recently in a study done at Emory, um, professionals started to notice that their patients were having blood clots, blood clotting in the smaller blood vessels. So they started to look into it more and notice that it was almost a common denominator among a lot of their patients. And currently now they're using this as a marker to see how far the COVID disease has made it uh, by testing the blood viscosity. And the fact that this relates back to um, cytokine storms, because cytokine storms, again, as I mentioned, can increase fibrogen in the blood flow, in the bloodstream, and fibrogen is one of those clotting factors that allows platelets to attach and form those clots. Um, but that is an emerging study, and there isn't any conclusive evidence there's actually a connection between cytokine storms. So, in general, though, when you take a step back and you look at the fact that these patients are noticing in, in, or their blood is thickening, if you combine that with high blood pressure, that doesn't set up for a great result because you're taking an already stressed situation with those blood vessels that already have a decent amount of pressure on them, and you're increasing that pressure by increasing the viscosity of the blood. It just sets them up for more complications and potentially lethal complications. Um, so in conclusion, there is still a lot to be studied. There's the physical link between the treatment for hypertension and the ACE2 protein where SARS-CoV-2 virus is binding and hypertension is associated with those higher level of cytokines, which again, can be tied back to many of the issues with COVID-19 patients in those extreme cases where they do experience those cytokine storms um, and then also experience blood clots. And here are my references. <laughs>